Okay, terrific. Here we go. Um, I think uh, Rich Palizzolo from Bluebird Bio, George Diaz from Mount Sinai, and myself, Jennifer Braswell, from the Arm Foundation for Cell and Gene Medicine are not used to the high production values of our video intro. Um, it's a little startling, but I'm, I'm glad for it. Um, I want to say welcome to everybody who's joined us, and I'd like to uh, wish those of you in California a good morning and those of you on the East Coast a good afternoon and give you some housekeeping details. Um, I appreciate you taking time to join us at Global Genes Live, a rare patient advocacy on Summit. We're excited for this session. Is a gene therapy right for your disease? Um, my name is Jennifer Braswell. I'm a senior advisor at the Arm Foundation for Cell and Gene Medicine, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get everything kicked off, I wanted to give you some housekeeping details. All attendees are currently muted to reduce confusion as you watch the presentation, but we do encourage you to participate by using the chat function in the ON24 window for questions you have throughout the session. The chat's always moderated and it's not moderated by us, so feel free to um, ask your questions and then we'll address them after we get through with a short introductory presentation. To open the chat, click on the blue chat button located on the meeting controls at the bottom of your screen. If there are questions that we can't answer in the time we have allotted, we'll do the best we can to follow up with you. Also, post your top takeaways and the good experiences that you're having during Global Genes Live on social media using the hashtag at Global Genes and you'll have a chance to be featured on Global Genes social media. The official event hashtag is pound 2020 GG Summit. L lastly, we encourage all of you to participate as active listeners and take advantage of the opportunity to hear from us and other leaders and experts here and ask us questions. The program is your time. We want to be talking about what you want to hear about. And so I encourage you to use the chat. And with that, I'll just start the conversation um, with my guests. For those of you who joined a little bit late, we've got George Diaz, who's a pediatrician and chief of medical genetics at Mount Sinai, and Rich Palazzolo, who's at Bluebird Bio in platform marketing. So what I thought we would do is um, I will give a very brief introduction to how gene therapy works. And then um, George Diaz will give you an example of, of a, a case in which he practiced gene therapy in his practice at Mount Sinai. And then Rich will talk to us about the importance of, of the understandings you're gaining and how to learn more. Does that sound good to you and George and Rich? Sounds good. good. Okay. Sounds great. Okay, so let me use my first slide. Good. So this diagram is very simple, and I'm trying to make one really important point. And the point that I want to make is it would be great for those of you who are interested in gene therapy to remember all the things you've learned about biology and cell biology, whether in your recent reading or in college or what you've learned on the web, and just get all the parts of how genes work together in one understanding. So what this is showing you is where the DNA is, which is making up the gene. The, the genes are bundled tightly together and exist on the chromosomes. The chromosomes are tightly bundled in the nucleus and it's very of the cell and the cell is what's operating your body. So the DNA and genes are the instruction booklet for your cell to make what it needs to make uh, to make the body operate. 
gene therapy is operates when one of the genes is either replaced because it's defective or changed in some way to make it effective, when a new gene can be introduced to the body, or when a gene that's, um, that's operating incorrectly is inactivated, meaning it's not making the proteins uh, it, it, or suppressing the proteins that the gene normally makes. If a mutated gene is making a protein not function correctly in the body, gene therapy seeks to restore the uh, gene's ability to make that protein and have the body function correctly. George, how do you think I did on that? <laughs> I think that uh, is pretty clear. Uh, you know, it brings us all the way back to uh, school biology through college at a rapid clip, so congrats. Good. Um, so why don't we go ahead, George, and have you advance. That's just my first one slide on how gene medicine works. And uh, you can carry on. And I'm hoping that your answer helps people understand when a gene therapy is most uh, thought to be most effective. OK, so um, the principles that you discussed, I think, are um, really important for us to keep in mind um, when we're thinking about what types of disorders might be uh, good candidates for gene therapy. And uh, an additional uh, uh, consideration is going to be um, which of the uh, disorders are inherited in different ways. So, you know, the, um, the inheritance pattern that we usually see, and I've got a slide up here showing kind of a, a very basic uh, schem schematic of how uh, conditions are inherited. Um, some conditions are inherited in what we think of as uh, a recessive uh, form. And, you know, we kind of, we've learned about this again in high school, uh, where you have two parents who each carry one normal working copy and one copy that has a change that renders it a little less functional. Um, and they are healthy because that um, copy that they have that is um, that is not affected gives them all the enzyme or protein activity they need. But if they have the um, the rare uh, and the bad luck of having a child with somebody with a change in the same gene, you've got one chance in four of having a child that has two copies that don't function as well as they should, and so that child will have genetic disease. So exactly what you were talking about, Jennifer, here we just want to replace the function that's not um, being provided by these genes that have um, these changes in them. So that's pretty straightforward and I think intuitive. Um, there is another scenario, however, where you only need a change in one of the copies, one of the two copies, in order to get a disease. And so that's a little more complicated um, because what um, you have there is a situation where um, one copy can be a little bit um, misfunctioning and you really have a situation where you need to provide a little more. So very similar to the first situation, the recessive inheritance. Um, or you can have a situation where having that change actually gives that um, gene a different function or it actively interferes with the function of the copy that is functioning normally. So that's a little more difficult to target right? because you, you can't just replace a function. You actually have to um, suppress that copy that has that, that change that's giving you an abnormal function. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me, but I think that it would help if you could say what you mean when you say you're targeting a gene. Sure, absolutely. So um, as you discussed you know, with the introduction to gene therapy, what we're doing is um, we're taking um, DNA, or in some cases RNA, and introducing it into a cell to provide the function that is not uh, normally act, not normally present in the situation where we've got changes in the DNA, right? So we're either introducing a fresh copy of this gene, right, with uh, with DNA, or we're going down one step and giving the messenger RNA that is uh, created from the DNA to allow the cell to make the protein that it needs, right? So so when we're talking about targeting, we're talking about replacing the DNA or the RNA for that gene that's not functioning well. One specific gene. That's right. Yeah. And so that's actually a really important point because you talked about um, chromosomal disorders, right, where a whole chromosome can be 
uh, duplicated or missing. And there are also um, disorders where you've got a, a part of a chromosome that's duplicated or missing. Uh, and there you're talking about many, many genes involved. And so those disorders aren't uh, amenable to gene therapy at this time. We're talking about single gene replacements. Um, we can't really do very much with um, these big chunks of, of genetic material that contain a lot of a lot of genes. Okay, good. Okay, so you asked me to talk a little bit about um, some of the work that I've done in gene therapy, and I think um, it it actually leads to a little bit of discussion about again picking um, a good a candidate disorder for which gene therapy might work. Um, so in my clinical work, I work in inborn errors of metabolism. I do a lot of work with uh, a set of conditions um, called the urea cycle disorders. So urea cycle disorders are conditions where our body doesn't metabolize ammonia appropriately. And um, it turns out that all of the body's uh, capacity to uh, take ammonia, which is a byproduct of normal protein uh, breakdown, whenever we eat you know, a steak, our body generates ammonia. Um, and that ammonia gets changed into urea, which is not toxic from a very toxic compound, ammonia, in the liver. So um, we can actually deliver the gene that is not working well, the urea cycle disorder, only to the liver, and we don't need to deliver anywhere else. We don't need to deliver to the muscle, to the brain, to the bone, because all of this activity is happening in the liver. Um, and so a disorder like a urea cycle disorder, like OTC deficiency, for which there are currently gene therapy trials uh, in progress, um, these are good candidates um, because we've got the machinery to actually deliver a gene pretty specifically to the liver, right? So, so and, that's a situation that, that is a, a good candidate target. So when you say you're delivering it to the, um, to, to the liver, you're saying that the gene, uh, the genetic information that you're going to put in is going to go right to the individual cells of the liver? Have I got that right? That's right. That's exactly right. Okay. Okay. Good. And so, so the goal there is to deliver enough of this, um, this genetic material into enough cells in the liver that the the function is restored um, to the point where the individual no longer has a problem um, getting rid of ammonia. Their their urea cycle will have been restored in enough cells to keep them healthy. So that would be the goal. So any disorder where you've got a single organ system that is um, we primarily affected, and we can deliver effectively. Like for example, um, in hemophilia, you know, this is one of the uh, good early examples. Um, the coagulation factors also are made in the liver, so targeting the liver is effective there. Um, if you're looking at red blood cell disorders, um, you can target stem cells pretty effectively. Um, white blood cell disorders, the same thing. So those are, are uh, more attractive candidates because the technology, you know, I think is, is effective in those instances. Um, but we also have conditions where um, the disease manifestations might not be restricted to just one organ. Um, and so this can be a little bit complicating. And so I have a slide up here about a different set of disorders also in um, metabolic disease where individuals are unable to break down specific amino acids. So we call those um, organic acidopathies, organic acid disorders. Um, and they currently are treated with um, a combination of diet and um, some supplementary treatments as well, uh, but the treatment isn't optimal. So in some cases, we actually um, offer liver transplantation to these patients. You know, a similar type of principle as gene therapy. We're giving them an organ now that can do the detoxification. Um, but the problem here is that in these conditions, uh, most of the enzyme activity isn't just in the liver. In fact, it might be predominantly in the muscle. So the liver transplantation isn't curative in the same way that it is for a urea cycle disorder that we just discussed. Um, so this makes um, targeting this particular disease a little trickier. It might work because a lot of activity, uh, the detoxification activity occurs in the liver, uh, but it's not gonna be a complete fix. Um, and so this principle that if you have diseases that are affecting multiple organ systems, um, you know, you're going to have to target those, those multiple systems. That's a little more difficult to do. So in considering what conditions might be good candidates for gene therapy, we have to think about where the disease activity is and can we reach it effectively. Okay, good. George, I have a couple of questions coming in that are um, specific um, about disease targets. Sure. Are you ready to answer that? So uh, one person asks sure. about um, Kennedy's disease, spinal bulbar muscular atrophy. It's an adult onset disease. 
And the question is, with gene therapy, um, would it be possible to treat that disease when, when the treatment becomes available at a young age before onset? Right. So that's an excellent question. And, um, you know, with neurologic diseases in, in general, um, we certainly want to um, affect a therapy before symptoms because, um, you know, if you start a treatment after symptoms have already progressed, um, we fre frequently we cannot reverse them. Um, and so that's a really important point. Uh, and I think Rich can really uh, speak to that with, uh, uh, with the you know, Bluebird's experience, certainly in uh, adrenal leukodystrophy and other uh, neurological disorders. Um, we know that if we wait too long until symptoms have evolved, um, you know, even a therapy that might have worked uh, in early, uh, you know, pre-symptomatic pre days will no longer um, work. So that's a very important point. And yes, you would want to treat before symptoms. Rich, do you have anything to add before I ask the next question? No. And I totally agree with you, George. I think um, absolutely trying to target specifically before the onset of specific um, implications is going to be absolutely critical, especially in those diseases that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So it would seem that it's important then to make sure that the, um, the genetic diagnosis, the diagnostic test is available and accurate. Yeah, right, good. absolutely. Um, the next question is, um, is this, can there be multiple genes involved in a disease, which you have addressed in terms of chromosomal disorders, but there are, um, the question is, can there be multiple genes involved in a disease? And if you're at the very beginning of the process of figuring out, figuring this out, how do you start? So that's um, that's a really good question. I'll, I'll actually just stick with the example that I put up um, about the organic acid disorders. Um, so these are disorders of, of specific enzyme activities, but those enzyme activities are actually um, carried out by enzyme, uh, but by protein complexes. And so, it, it, so we have a disease entity. Uh, there are multiple genes that contribute to that complex, and mutations in any one of those uh, co genes that, that contribute to the complex can cause the condition. So, yes, there are um, certainly disorders where you've got you know multiple genes that are responsible for a common um, clinical condition at the end. You know, so so you have multiple genetic targets, and you know the first thing to do is to identify um, are there particular uh, genes that are uh, mutated in higher prevalence. So it may be that, you know, there is one specific sub uh, subunit that really accounts for most of disease. Um, and so then that's kind of where you would start. You would need to have uh, some genetic data available regarding, you know, the epidemiology of the disease, you know, what proportion of disease is caused by which genes, are there specific uh, mutations, or, you know, is it kind of uh, multiple mutations across the, the gene? So um, that type of information is helpful. Okay, good. Um, I have a very specific question again. What it's the questioner is asking, what about LOF versus GOF calcium channelopathies like CACNA1A? It's not something I'm familiar with. Can you answer that one? Right. Sure. So um, the question is about loss of function versus gain of function uh, mutations. And so in the, the autosomal dominant example that uh, we had discussed, um, you know, I was pointing out that you can have uh, a loss of function where, you know, the, the underlying uh, pathology is caused by having not enough of the protein. Uh, so that's uh, the loss of function in the channelopathies. You just don't have enough uh, of this um, sodium channel to uh, do the job of uh, neurotransmission correctly versus a gain of function where you've got, um, you know, something that works um, in a different way and it's not regulated uh, appropriately. So a dysregulation. Uh, implies that you actually have to get rid of um, this functioning unit uh, because even if you provide more of a normal copy, you still have this this misfunctioning unit that is uh, you know firing inappropriately. So loss of function in principle, you can treat you know with the types of approaches we've discussed where you're providing more of the you know the functional copy, uh, but gain of function is not going to to that's not going to work 
you're going to actually need to to in some way suppress the production of um, that gene that is that is acting um, kind of you know in a dysregulated fashion. So those are there are different approaches there, and um, you know there are some mechanisms um, that one can use to silence a gene or uh, to target it for degradation. Um, but th those are you know really fundamentally different than the approach that we've been discussing to now of providing a gene um, that's not there in in a sufficient quantity. So oh, for good. the um, yeah for the channelopathies, I think that's a very it's a tough target, and you know these are important considerations. Great. I have a number of questions coming in specifically about. Um, about brain and neurological function. But before we get to them, uh, George, this is your last slide. I was thinking maybe we would talk to Rich um, about opportunities to learn more about, about the, this topic. Um, sure. Do you want to bring up your slide, Rich, and talk about the gene home? Yes. And hopefully that came up. I'm having, there we go. Perfect. Um, yeah, that's great. And I think it's a nice follow-on to, to what um, George was talking about because there's so many nuances to gene therapy and there's so much to learn and understand. And I think even in the beginning when we were talking about going back to you know high school or middle school biology classes, it's really important to understand that foundation um, of the human body to help you understand in genetics to why gene therapy is was created and how it's used and how it can help um, in so many disease states. So at uh, Bluebird Bio, we've really taken this to heart and I think things are evolving all the time. How do we make sense of all the information out there? Um, so we created the genome.com, which really is a destination to help start to set that foundational education for gene therapy. Um, it's approachable and the idea is, you know, you can come in at any educational level. I tend to be a little bit more on the high level, and then we can get down into the more deeper level to where you know, George and Jennifer um, can you know, explore more and help to kind of learn. So I think you know, there are lots of great resources out there, big pieces that we wanna make sure is that from the ARM Foundation, Global Genes and others, to leverage those resources because there's so much information. Um, and the more informed that you are, the better uh, decision-making you can make. Um, I'm bringing this slide, I, I'm giving Rich this opportunity to talk about the Gene Home because at the ARM Foundation for Cell and Gene Medicine, we also focus on, on education here with our website, healinggenes.org. Um, but my message to the people who are looking in today is we are all striving to make our information to you understandable. And if we're missing, if we're missing the boat, if you are not understanding, um, we really want you to stay in contact with us. Healinggenes.org or the armfoundation.org is a great place to give in your questions. Global genes participation is another great way to get your 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 questions known so that we can continue to educate in the way we want. Because the power of these uh, therapeutic ideas are not going to come to fruition unless you understand really well what the scientists, researchers, and doctors are talking about, so that you can be part of the community of, of therapy. Um, so let me now uh, ask these questions that, that bear on, um, on nervous system and brain. The first is, um, what are the realistic expectations of gene therapy for conditions that affect brain and neurological function? George, I'm gonna give this one to you and I'd recommend that you talk about short term, meaning where the science and medicine is now. You're a pediatrician, so it's, a, I'm sure, a subject that's of strong interest to you. But maybe we can talk about sort of one to three year landscape and then the future landscape. Right, so 
Um, again, I'm, I'm slightly um, out of my field here uh, because, again, I'm, I'm really focused on inborn errors of metabolism, which is kind of you know how your body um, processes ingested uh, foods, be that protein, carbs, or um, lipids. Um, and the conditions that I treat typically affect um, you know the liver, kidney, muscles. Um, and they can have neurological um, impacts as well. That's an important piece of it, um, but they're not primarily neurologic diseases. So, you know, I, you know, take what I say with a grain of salt. Absolutely, go talk to a neurologist for sure. Um, but one of the, you know, the important inborn nerves of metabolism that we um, have been kind of uh, following for years, uh, and for which we are now doing newborn screening in New York State and some other states, is X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy, um, you know, which Bluebird Bio is uh, intimately. Uh, involved with. And so, you know, this is, uh, I think, um, a good example of a, a disorder that is primarily neurologic um, and for which targeting um, is really um, effective. And, you know, we, we, there are uh, good clinical studies that are ongoing now um, to try to uh, validate this as a therapeutic approach. So I think, you know, in, in the short term, um, you know, we've, we've already got some success under our belts. And so I think that that's an important piece. But um, each of these conditions requires an enormous investment by a community. Um, so it's, you know, it's got to be um, the advocacy community, it's got to be the scientific community, uh, and pharma all together to kind of pull these products across the finish line. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that that is uh, an important message. Um, so for the neurologic disorder, certainly, but for any of the uh, rare diseases that we're talking about. Um, so you know, kind of developing that infrastructure for a specific disease is going to help uh, make treatment a reality. I think that's an important message. You know, um, people pulling together in, in a forum like this um, hopefully can, can accelerate developments. Good, Rich, is there anything you'd like to add from Bluebird's perspective? No, I, and I, I love that point that you made, George, around the kind of collaboration across advocacy, the scientific community, pharma, everybody really needs to kind of work together here to bring these forward. And um, patients and families and caregivers are such a big piece of that. Um, so I think acknowledging that today is really important. Thanks. Good. The questions are coming in thick and fast. So now I'm starting to um, have to select from among them. I'm going to start with a question that uh, bears right on your area of expertise, George, and, and it's this. Is there any concern that targeting the liver will disrupt the natural function of the liver over the long term? And this question is, is broad-based because it, help, it, it, it could help us understand what the difference between targeting one gene is and the, what we would call a normal function of an organ. Right, right. So that, that's a, an excellent question. And I think, um, you know, considerations of what are the side effects here are, are, are super important. Um, and as a researcher uh, in urea cycle disorders, you know, we're really acutely aware of this uh, because, you know, we have um, uh, kind of all um, dealt with directly or indirectly the, the legacy of Jesse Gelsinger and, you know, the early gene therapy um, uh, problems where that led to a, a tragic uh, death. So, you know, the, the long-term complications, you know, we're only going to know uh, when we do the long-term follow-up studies. I mean, I think that that's uh, a reality for any new therapy. Um, the kinds of, of vectors that we've been talking about, the kinds of delivery vehicles that we've been talking about generally are non-degrading, which means that the DNA doesn't go into, the, into your own genome. It kind of sits outside of um, the, the nuclear DNA that, um, you know, that we have uh, intrinsically. And that's, that's an important property because um, one, hopefully it reduces the risk of activating a gene that shouldn't be activated and need, leading to a complication like, like cancer in a cell that you've introduced this uh, piece of DNA into. Uh, but also when that cell divides, and for instance, in the liver cell, we know they're constantly dividing, uh, because that DNA isn't anchored, it's going to be lost. Um, and so we know that over time, um, some of the are going to, to be um, kind of lost um, progressively and slowly. And we don't know how long you know, it's going to take for any given individual. Um, I do think that it is a, a built-in safety mechanism um, mm -hmm. that will preclude you know, the hypoxicities of you know, kind of chronic overexpression um, you know, over many, many years. Now, in the medium term, maybe there are going to be some issues 
producing a, a gene in a way that is not being regulated as is usual. Um, and that's certainly a consideration. I think it's it's theoretical at this point, and you know we don't have um, you know any solid long-term data except for the clinical trials that have been in progress. And for instance, hemophilia, you know, over um, you know five years, ten years, um, kind of time stretches. Okay, very very interesting discussion. Um, there's a question about um, autosomal dominant genes and how gene therapy works for autosomal dominant genes. And the questioner asks, does that, if, if the disease is caused in my child by a mutation on the autosomal dominant gene, does that automatically, does that necessitate silencing the mutated gene? Uh, the question is, or could it just not be producing more? How do we know? So the, there's a couple right. of questions about autosomal dominant disease. Right. Uh, so I, I think that's because so many disorders are dominant in nature, it's important to um, really um, hash that out. So the, the answer is it, there are dominant disorders where you don't have enough of the, the protein being produced, and that's the underlying cause of the disease. Right, so you just you know you you have one copy that works, but that's not enough. You actually need two copies to work. Um, in that case, you know, uh, replacing the activity is fine, and you know the approaches that we've been discussing, where you introduce a gene, um, potentially could work. You know that that there's no um, conceptual issue with that. Um, but if you have a, a situation where um, this protein that is produced is acting in an abnormal fashion, so it's a gain of function, let's say, uh, or actively interfering with the function of the copy that is not affected by a change, uh, DNA change, um, then that really implies that you're going to have to somehow suppress um, that activity. And you know there are, there are many potential ways you could do that. You could potentially target that pharmacologically. You know, it doesn't have to be gene therapy. But if you're talking about gene therapy, um, it would mean that you want to regulate uh, the production of that gene so it's not being, so you basically want to reduce the production of this abnormal protein, which is giving you a, you know, a, a very negative consequence. And would that be the technique that uh, we've heard called silencing the gene? That's right, yeah. Okay. So um, the, the, those kinds of mechanisms would work. Okay, I, I have a comment that says, thank Dr. Diaz, good explanation. I'm really glad to hear about that. Um, and, uh, there's a couple of different things we're gonna talk about in the time remaining. One is gene therapy for de novo or spontaneous mutations. And the other is specifically about uh, adeno-associated virus and vectors. Let's talk about gene therapy for de novo mutations first. First, if you would tell a little bit about de novo mutations and then uh, whether gene therapy might be effective there. Okay. Um, so, so de novo is um, just um, a way of saying that this mutation, this change, is happening for the very first time in the individual uh, patient that we're, we're, we're talking about. And so that is differentiated from an inherited mutation where the change is coming from uh, one or both of the parents. So, mm -hmm. you know, de novo mutations, it, it, there's nothing um, special about them other than, you know, they happen to have occurred in this specific individual. And, you know, kind of coming back to my example of OTC deficiency, uh, urea cycle disorder, um, there are a large proportion of people uh, who inherited these changes from parents. Um, but, you know, a minority of them will be people who, for the first time, there's no family history at all, they are the first people that, that had this mutation occur in them. And are, right, so that's are de novo. They de novo changes the first time. Are the de novo um, mutations diagnosed in the same way as inherited mutations? Yeah, yes. Everything okay. else about it is, is just the same clinical symptoms, everything else the same. It's just it doesn't occur in your family. Okay. Um, so that the treatment possibilities are um, That's right, appropriately equivalent. Okay. Um, then let's talk a little bit about um, about different types of vectors. 
when we what when, when I try to explain what a vector is, um, I I've talked about in the past um, vectors as the delivery mechanism. And I emphasize that, and that's why I show that first slide every time, because the idea is that the genetic information needs to have a way to get past the protective barrier of the cell nucleus and into the right place. So there's a question about um, pros and cons to the different types of AAVs based on the areas of the body that are affected. Um, George, are there differences in the use of a adeno-associated uh, vectors based on the areas of the yeah. body targeted? Or do you think? Right. So I, I think you know, the um, again I'm not a um, uh, a gene therapy um, a vector specialist. Um, I'm more on the on the administration end. But um, you know these particular delivery vehicles, these adenovirus uh, adeno associated viruses, um, exist in nature, and you know um, a, a proportion of us have already been exposed to them just by natural infection, and they don't typically have any symptoms. They kind of come along with uh, adenovirus, um, and there are a large number of them, and so some of them have specificity for um, proteins that are expressed on liver cells. And so there, there's a receptor uh, interaction, and so they go into liver cells and they kind of uh, infect the liver cell. Others have specificity for, um, for brain, for muscle. Um, so there are very specific vectors, uh, AAV uh, delivery vehicles, that can target uh, with a significant specificity um, organ systems that are of interest. So the AAVs, you know, it, there's a, a, a whole suite of them that are being developed for targeting different tissues. So that's important. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have to know if your disorder uh, actually has an effective AAV targeting vehicle, you know, kind of as a first step. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that what, what you're describing is uh, different therapeutics that are, are identified in a really specific way for specific genetic diseases, where those diseases manifest themselves in the body. And then the th on the therapy side, the vector's chosen really specifically by the developer of the therapeutic, as is the, the mechanism of delivery for the body. So what, when we're trying to answer these general questions, the answer, it depends, is sometimes very unsatisfying to the questioner, but it does really seem like it depends on a wide range of factors. Right. Yeah, no, and I hope that the discussion um, uh, is bringing that out, that there are a number of different considerations. And um, so there's an interplay here. Uh, so you kind of have to know um, about your disease and how it's inherited and you know the many other factors. Good point. And Rich, and Rich for, for the education materials that Bluebird is providing, what, what sort of outlook do you take about how you're trying to um, use those educational materials? Absolutely. Really trying to take kind of a broad and objective perspective because there are so many pieces and so many nuances like we're talking about. How do we start with those foundations? So even vectors, there are so many questions I think, and about viral, non-viral vectors. Um, so trying to just lay that foundation so that way you can feel like you have enough information when you go into your doctor to talk about it and know some of these terms, because these aren't your day-to-day -day terminology. Um, so really getting acquainted with it um, to help make that conversation hopefully be as fruitful as possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, at the Arm Foundation for Cell and Gene Medicine, we've uh, focused much earlier on in the year and, and do throughout our activities work a lot on nomenclature, on how, how to use the words right among all of us. And I'd ask everybody to kind of join that effort so that um, we're not using one word to mean a whole lot of things, nor are we... Uh, um, using a whole lot of different words that actually mean one thing. So I think that the, the nomenclature efforts um, and, and efforts to get the words that patients and families use 
and pediatricians use and researchers and pharma companies use um, into, into a, whole, um, uh, a, a good communicative uh, world where we're using the same words for the same thing. I think that would be a huge help. Um, totally I have, uh, I'm trying to look at the time and trying to make sure we've hit the questions. Um, here's one that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give uh, some effort to. The comment is, de novo mutations can be mosaic and rare, but sometimes require a DNA test on the skin. It, this makes diagnosis difficult. Could you address some of those issues, George, in the best way you know how? Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, I, I'm really happy that that um, question came up because um, we, I've been speaking, you know, as broadly as possible. Um, I didn't want to get um, kind of too uh, detail oriented to make this as uh, applicable. But this is a really important point um, that uh, diagnostics are not necessarily straightforward. So uh, this particular scenario is one where you have a new mutation, but it doesn't occur um, very early on in development. You know, when you, you're basically at a a few, uh, you know, cell stage of uh, of an embryo, um, it can occur. A mutation can occur later, and so only a proportion of your tissues carry that mutation. Um, and what that might mean is, if you do a blood test for genetic testing, um, maybe it's not in the blood tissue, and so that genetic test um, may come back with nothing. So it's really um, at that point, you know, kind of up to the the physicians and the parents to work together to really run down all of the possibilities to make sure that the correct diagnosis is made. And mosaicism is a very difficult um, thing to deal with because you don't know where in the body those those cells that are containing the mutation, uh, where they reside. Um, they can be anywhere. Um, so you might need to look at multiple places to actually identify. Uh, but it's super important because if you don't do you know that, uh, that work, then the patient never gets a diagnosis and can't benefit from any of the therapies that we're talking about. So these diagnostic efforts in cases where you know it really looks like there's something genetic going on, but we keep drawing a blank, uh, important to think about alternative explanations like um, mosaicism. So thanks for the comment. Yeah, good. Um, George, you were just talking about the treatment team um, of the physicians and the patients and their families. And when we were prepping for this, this presentation, Rich, we talked a lot about the treatment team and and um, it most importantly includes patients and their families. Can you talk about their involvement? This is an absolutely direct feed to what I care about most. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about the importance of patients and their families? Sure, I mean, absolutely critical um, to this. And, you know, George talked about it earlier too, about how important the collaboration across all parties, but the patients and families have so many opportunities. You know, one, I think clinical trials are just so important, and, and the patients and families that work through those and experience those and commit to those um, are the foundation of how we continue to grow um, and really evolve in medicine. So that's an absolutely critical uh, portion. I think the other piece, well, there's many ways, but um, really just thinking too about how kind of aligning with advocacy organizations, making sure that their voice is being heard, that they are bringing their questions, concerns, thoughts to the table in any manner. I think you mentioned it earlier, Jennifer, it's so important that we hear that and try to make sure that we are making it as clear as we can. Um, and helping people to really see the pros, the cons, the benefits, the, you know, potential implications, things like that, so that there's full transparency across. Um, and ultimately, you know, this isn't, like I've talked about it a few couple of times, this isn't always easy to understand. So it's important to be really invested in that full care team and making sure that you're asking questions and it's okay to ask any question, especially when it right. comes to gene therapy, we're all learning together. Um, so that's a few different ways. What are your yeah. thoughts, Jennifer? Um, I was listening to some previous sessions during Global Genes Live um, in the previous days, and this this point about asking the question and, and how to ask the questions come up a lot of times. 
And I mm. know um, I know that from your point of view in industry and from George's point of view in medicine, the the effort that people make to ask their questions is so valuable to us. I just want to use this moment to say thank you, thank you, thank you to patients and families that spend their time on forums like this and keep asking us things because I, I've skipped a couple of questions in the chat, but they'll be captured for us, for Rich and, uh, and, and George and myself. They'll be captured so that as we keep working on education, we can keep hearing that voice. So to all participants on this session, I wanna really thank you. And um, I can't say enough about participants in clinical trials. Um, it's another area where a lot of education is needed, but clinical trials is where uh, therapeutic developers and physicians are getting educated and the whole world is getting educated. So that the participation in clinical trials is really something that is an extraordinary gift to the world. Um, looking at the time, and I see we only have four minutes left. I want to uh, say again, thank you to Rich Palazzolo from Bluebird Bio and George Diaz, uh, Chief of Medical Genetics at ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. I'm not saying goodbye to you. I'm just thanking you by name because I know people, um, people uh, come and go in attendance and I wanna make sure. I also wanted to recognize the sponsor of our session who's Taisha Therapeutics. Um, for all the attendees, I, I, I want everybody to realize that um, new companies, established companies, companies that are just a twinkle in the founder's eye um, and, and are, are all very interested in, in, in your advocacy. Um, okay, what more am I supposed to do? Um, I'm seeing something good, which is that there are a lot of comments thanking the speakers for excellent information, and I'm really glad to hear that. I got one real specific one for you, George. <laughs> sure. Can a disease that is mitochondrial-based be also autosomal <laughs> dominant this is like a like a quiz question <laughs> right well mitochondrial disease is um you know so complicated so complicated uh, and there are many many modes of inheritance uh including dominance for sure um so it's typical when we think about this as coming from the mother's mitochondrial genome right mother to any child but also can be do dominant and recessive Okay, thanks very much. I am gonna say thank you now because I think I have some housekeeping to do. Um, the first is I wanna point out to our patient advocates and foundation members that there's a two-part series, Understanding Cell and Gene Medicine, September 29th at one o'clock, which is uh, hosted by me so you can hear more about education in cell and gene medicine. Um, and the, the next day, September 30th, an emphasis on how you can use materials that Global Genes and the ARM Foundation present to educate your communities. So what we're trying to do here is have you learn from us and then you take that learning and bring it to your uh, patient advocacy communities. Um, and if you are not a member of the Rare Foundation Alliance, please join. This is a very significant part of Global Genes activities. It will make you eligible to listen to the two presentations I just uh, mentioned on September 29th and 30th. And I have one minute left, maybe. Um, You've all been really gracious helping me use this new forum. This is really quite unfamiliar to me. I watch a lot of Zoom, spend a lot of time on Zoom, but um, trying to reach the participants in this electronic forum has been just a joy. Thank you very much, George Diaz from Mount Sinai and Rich Palizolo from Bluebird.
You're welcome. My pleasure. You. Thanks to everyone. Are we still here? Did a good job. Yeah, uh, there yeah you nice go. job. George, yeah, I wanted to thank you. What did you say? I wanted to thank you both. That was great. I really it was enjoyed that. Great. Yeah, thank you time so much. Goes, I learned a lot. Time too, goes, so thank you. I did too. Yeah. Time <laughs> goes by real time goes by really quickly. And I have to say, it's way too much information on this presenter oh, sure. view. Um, 